Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Our show is about retirement. Speaking personally, I always identified retirement with basking on a beach somewhere in the south of France while I waited to go over the waterfall. For many, however, retirement does not necessarily mean an easy transition. More time with one's spouse, less money, and more boringly idle moments. Our guest, the journalist and author Jane Bryant Quinn, has written a brilliant best-selling book entitled How to Make Your Money Last, The Indispensable Retirement Guide, in which she treats some of the serious emotional, financial, and health challenges of retirement years. Jane Bryant Quinn has been a syndicated financial columnist, a TV reporter, the writer of a consumer newsletter, a popular speaker, and the author of seven books. The World Almanac has named her as one of the 25 most influential and powerful women in America. Jane, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Jim. I'm very happy to be here. Are you influential and powerful? <laughs> well, <laughs> it depends on how many people read the book. I, I think with, with this book, you certainly are. A collection of this can change the world. <laughs> That's right. Now, uh, let's just start with Jane Bryant Quinn. Uh, can you tell us how uh, you first got started in... Um, personal finance journalism? I got started serendipitously, actually. When I was 22 years old, I came to New York and was looking for a job, and I was hired by a newsletter called the Insider's Newsletter, published oh, I by that. Look Magazine, where you were, you were an <laughs> insider. <laughs> and we were covering the consumer movement, which was growing and developing then. And so the person who hired me said, all right, we want you to do the money stories. And I said, I don't know anything about money. And she said, learn. <laughs> and I did. I read the books and papers. I found the experts. I talked to them on the telephone. And it turned out that I had a knack for it. I loved it. I got really interested in, in consumer financial issues. I saw they were important. And if I hadn't liked it, obviously, I would have gone on to some other line of journalism. But I stuck with this. Well, you had a 27-year run, which ended in 2001, uh, with uh, the Washington Post Writers Group. Uh, it was called Staying Ahead. And uh, it was very, very successful. Uh, and uh, why did you stop? And, and when you stopped, uh, was that a retirement? <laughs> uh, no, that was not most emphatically not a retirement. I stopped that column for a couple of reasons. First, my longtime researcher was retiring, <laughs> that, which was important. I thought, oh, train somebody else all over again. Second, I was working seven days a week because at the same time I was doing CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. I was doing the Newsweek column. Uh, and I was doing the newspaper column, and that was really seven days a week. And my husband, now my late husband, became ill, and I said, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it. So I missed it. I really liked that column. I was writing two a week, but I was doing so much else. And then, you know, personal issues arise at home, and I said, well, I'm stopping. So that was a pause. No, because I, I kept on writing the Newsweek uh, column, and I kept and I wrote a book. That was when I updated my uh, making the most of your money, the, my, my my big all-purpose book. <laughs> How to this this is my latest, but the other one, the the big one, has been in print since 1991, and so I did an update on that. So why did you want to write this book about making your money last uh, through retirement? Because this seems to me to be the huge question. 10,000 people a day are now turning 65. And so we have the whole baby boomer generation coming up to and going into retirement. And unless you're really rich, the question you have is, how am I going to pay my bills for the next period of time now that I have no paycheck anymore? And it's and then you come up against your longevity, which is, at 65, you might live another 20 or 30 years. What are you going to do with that time, and how are you going to pay your bills? So putting the longevity 
together with maybe you ha haven't saved enough money, how do you take what you have now when your paycheck stops, your savings, maybe a pension, uh, uh, social security, and how do you figure out that how that money is going to last for the next 30 years when you don't know how long you're going to live and if you're married you don't know how long your spouse is going to live. So this is a huge problem and I wrote this book to try to help people solve it. Well, uh, before we get to the financial component, uh, there's an emotional component to retirement as well, isn't there? And you write about it uh, and in a very, very interesting way. Why don't you talk a little bit about uh, the emotions of finding yourself in retirement. Well, you know, all your life you've been a, 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 you've been a lawyer, you've been a reporter, you've been a doctor, you've been a teacher, you've been whatever you've been, and that was very much part of your identity. And then when you're when you step into retirement's door, suddenly you say, "Who am I?" And you're free. So. The first morning you retire, you know, it's wonderful. You get up, you sleep late, you have a cup of coffee. Now you're free, but free to do what? So not having a structured life can be suddenly shocking. And the transition, two kinds of transitions. First, you need to find something to do with your life because you're going to live the next 20 or 30 years. You can't play that much golf or that, watch that much television. And the other thing is... You have is, the three G's of retirement in your book. The three G well, retirement. Well, well, Gossip, golf, and... Grandchildren. Grandchildren. And grandchildren. Right. I was suddenly thinking grandchildren. You know, and gossip is... I think all... Well, I don't play golf, but I think... Gossip and grandchildren are fine with me, but they are not going to fill my time for 30 years. So you need to find a new identity, which is that of, sort of engaged citizen retired. And how you get from your former identity as whatever kind of job you did to this other, this new identity, and are relaxed and happy and peaceful with it, that can be a very bumpy transition. How do you... Uh get past the transition, and we, then once you pass the transition, what do you do with your time? You know, there are, uh, this has sort of been studied, this transition from, from being an active worker to being a full-time happy retiree. And there are basically, there are, well, there are five stages. First, there are the pre-retirement nerves. You're very happy, you're excited, but you don't know what it's going to be. Then is the honeymoon, you know, freedom, I'm free, I'm free, we can do all kinds of things. Then um, you get to a stage where you're free, but you haven't figured out how to fill all of these hours. And your calendar is blank, and here it is the afternoon, and you took a whole morning to look at the paper and have your coffee. <laughs> now what are you going to do this afternoon? And so very often a depression sets in during this period. Also money may be going out the door faster than you expected or intended. And then you get to the fourth stage, which is that you reevaluate because you've probably been doing a little volunteer work or maybe you're doing part time. Or maybe you're an Uber driver. You know, that's a lot of older people are starting to drive with Uber these days for part time work. So you look around and you say, what is it that I like best of what I'm doing? So you find a way to involve yourself in life. And also you do what I call right-size your life, which means you figure out the finances so you're not worried about money. And then you reach finally this fifth stage, which is stability, which is now you are your new person, you are retired, you have activities, you know what you're going to do when you get up in the morning, and you are happy. You need to have something for yourself to do, whether it's work, whether it's being in a business, whether it's the volunteering. I mean, this is a good year to join a campaign and get involved in politics. There are uh, some, something that you used to do when you're, you were a kid. I have a friend who uh, was in the depression stage of stopping teaching in this case, and she used to play clarinet when she was in high school and she took up clarinet again and now she's playing with a quartet she's going to competitions it never occurred to her that she would ever get caught up in that again but 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 it now really quite occupies her life and it's just obviously it doesn't occupy seven days a week but you need something to do that makes you feel valuable and makes you feel part of life so you're not just sitting in your chair
So he could run for president. I mean, Sanders is uh, 74, Trump's 70, uh, <laughs> Hillary's 68. They're all eligible for Social Security, <laughs> well, whether or not they need it. <laughs> but, you know, um, actually running for office is something one could do when you retire. Very often, if people are politically minded, they get much more civically involved in the community. They go on the school board or you know, they, they run for local planning office or something. So uh, I, I always say, make a list. Start thinking of all of the things that ever made you happy or ever got you interested. And even if it's off the wall somewhere, write it all down. And then start thinking about how you could get involved in various ways. You really can't spend 20 or 30 years on the couch. Although, Jim, I should say, not we've been talking about the fortunate people who retire and are healthy and are able to take care of themselves and get involved. You know, some, sometimes you retire because you're disabled or it becomes difficult. So... Uh, even in even if you're in a wheelchair, obviously there's lots you can do. Sometimes there isn't lots you can do. But whatever it is, whatever health situation you have, you've got to find a way to get yourself involved. But there's so many possibilities. I mean, uh, former Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, age 83, started a new app called Churchill Solitaire, which he thinks is going to be a great success. So <laughs> well, you can start your own business on the Internet. That is one thing. The Internet is really a marvelous thing for retired people. At first, you can waste wonderful hours on it, having great fun poking around looking for things. And you can start a business on it, and you can get involved on it. And speaking with grandchildren, I have a, a regular Skype date with my grandchildren, so that's another good thing. That's another good thing. Uh, now, let's turn to tactics. Um, uh, I guess one question is, well, I'm retiring. Uh, do I have to curtail my lifestyle? Do I have to trim back on my expenses and uh, not be able to enjoy so many of the things I've, I've known and loved for years? You might have to. It depends on how much you saved. And, and this is the question when you come up to retirement. If you come prepared, if you've been able to save enough money, you're obviously in much better shape than you would be if you unexpectedly lost your job or became ill or your spouse became ill and then it becomes a much more difficult thing to face. But this is what I call right-sizing your life and this is just so important at this time is that you make a projection of how much income you are going to have how much Social Security, if you're lucky enough to have a pension, what kind of a pension, and then if you have some savings or investments, uh, what kind of income can you get from that? And obviously in the book I wrote about how you figure out how much income you can get from your savings. And once you put together what your income is going to be, then you start looking at your expenses and say, how do I fit this within my income? I see a lot of retirees saying, uh, this is what I need for retirement, and that's backwards. The, the way to say it is, how much will I have coming in, and how do I fit my needs with that? Most people in retirement wind up trimming a little bit. Sometimes it's if it's a major gap between your current expenses and your probable income. Maybe you have to do something big like sell a house, and the sooner you know that, the better. But uh, almost everybody trims in retirement. And even if your friends don't tell you they have, they probably have. Well, there's certain obvious things that are job-related. I may be a member of uh, various professional organizations that I don't need to remain affiliated with anymore. I may be a member of a number of clubs that are uh, oh, yes. job-related. When, when you uh, retire, your expenses will drop, or should drop, I should say, <laughs> depending on what you do. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, but because you're not paying Social Security taxes anymore, you're not paying Medicare taxes anymore, uh, any other kinds of... Uh, kinds of things you're talking about, uh, commuting expenses, uh, work-related expenses, all of those go away. Now, early in retirement, people often say, well, they want to have a little fun with their money. And so, you know, taking a trip uh, may be very common. So, in fact, you may wind up uh, spending some of that money that you used to pay in Social Security taxes. You might wind up spending it on a cruise somewhere. But that dies down, too. The research is very interesting on this, Jim, because 
people generally spend less in retirement, and this includes people who theoretically don't have to. And they generally spend a little less than the inflation rate in retirement. So obviously some people have to cut back, but there's, there's also just something about the rhythm of retirement you know, you have your stuff. You're not going to redecorate the living room. Uh, you might say, I only need one car. I don't need two. And these are sort of automatic living things that tend to happen. It is easier to cut back than you think. Again, assuming that you're prepared. People who, uh, I, I certainly don't want to pretend that somebody at, you know, 58 who's forced to retire because you lose your job, that's going to be a very difficult time. And it's essential there that you see how much income you're going to have. But if you are, you know, if you're fortunate, uh, you will find that you can probably get by easier than you think. So at what age should someone start to think about retirement? Uh, 30s, 40s, 50s? <laughs> uh, they should, well, you know, in your... Everybody says, well, start saving for retirement in your 20s. Now, what reasonable 20-year-old are, are you going to go to who says, yes, you start, have to start thinking now about what you're going to be when you're 60? If you are in a company retirement plan, if you're one of the fortunate ones at 20 or 30, then of course sign up for it. And because it's a wonderful way to save money for the future. When do people, and, and that's something that happens automatically, so you don't have to think about retirement. You just say to your company, fine, put me in the plan and then I'll have some money. But uh, people get usually serious about retirement in their 40s and even more serious in their 50s. And, and there's a lot of catching up to do and it's and you know, when you're younger you've got kids to educate it's uh, it's a very expensive life up until that point now you have some uh, marvelous uh, tips about avoiding certain pitfalls and about not leaving money on the table one is about social security now I'm eligible now for social security when I'm how old <laughs> You're eligible at 62. At 62. So should I take it at 62 and run, or I can get more with a, a larger uh, monthly payout mm -hmm. if I wait? Well, you can get more if you wait. And so the advice always is, if you can, delay, delay, delay taking your Social Security check. At 62, you get there's a 25% discount off what you could get at your full retirement age. And your full retirement age is going to be 66, so that's what they call your, your, your insured amount. That's your full retirement amount. However, you can also delay your retirement all the way to 70, and are you claiming Social Security, I should say, all the way to 70. And for each year you delay, you get a guaranteed increase of 8% plus inflation. And that's a pretty good return. And the difference between taking a check at 62 and taking a check at 70, it's 76% increase. Now, clearly not everybody can afford to wait. You know, if you, you lose your job, you have a very modest income, and you didn't save very much money, you're going to take it at 62 because you have to. But if you don't have to take it at 62, I beg you not to. Some people do. Here's why. They say, well... Burden the hand. I, but not the government a, may go bankrupt, just not, the way the Republicans say. All, all of these kinds of things, but also I would feel rooked. If I didn't take it at 62 and I said I'm going to wait for a bigger check and then I died, God forbid, at 65, I would feel rooked because I didn't paid all those taxes in and I didn't take it out. My response to this is, excuse me, you will be dead. You will not be feeling anything. And it would be better for you to have waited because if you're married, you have left a larger check behind for your spouse by putting off your retirement. So, and longevity insurance. Remember, we talked about you're going to live 20 or 30 years. By delaying that check and having a higher check to start with, you are going to guarantee yourself a larger check when you're in your 70s, in your 80s, in your 90s. Okay, so that's one approach. Uh, another approach are annuities. You talk about annuities in the book. Now, I once prosecuted a criminal case against someone who peddled an, an annuity to a 95-year-old man. Good uh, for Do that. annuities make sense for everybody? Well, well but there's... 
two, there's, there's what I call white hat annuities and there are black hat annuities. The black hat annuity is the kind you prosecuted. Right. Uh, a black hat annuity, is, well, I call it that, it's a deferred variable annuity with living benefits, blah, 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 and the idea is you put your money in, uh, invest it in mutual funds, you lock it, it's locked up for a while, which is why you shouldn't buy it at 95, locked up for a while, and then you get a payment for the rest of your life, but the payment is guaranteed 5%, and, but maybe it could go higher. And you think, oh, this is terrific. Uh, it'll probably go higher because I'm not going to collect for 10 or 15 years, so I'm going to buy it. But you're paying a commission of 5 to 7% of the money you put in, maybe 10%. You are paying fees of 3.5% a year. The answer being, you will never get any more mm. than the minimum guarantee. And people think the minimum is uh, guarantee is, I, oh, well, I earn 5% of my money. That sounds all right. No, you do not. They pay you back your money. The insurance company pays you back your own money in 5% increments. Nobody understands that. So you have to live until almost 90 before you get your money back out of that. So that, that's the black hat annuity. I know it's complicated, but it's the one that most advisors try to sell people. And that's as, as soon as you hear living benefits and stock market connection, I just want you to run away, please. So get a white, a white hat annuity. A white hat annuity. A white hat annuity is it's for someone who had they've looked at their savings they sort of considered what all their income is and they say i think i can make it but i'm not sure and in this which is probably most of us in this situation you take uh, uh, some money that you have saved you put it into something called an immediate pay annuity and the insurance company says, okay, you've given me this amount of money, $50,000. In return, I will pay you X amount for the rest of your life. Very simple, very clean, very low cost. And if you ha are keeping some money in, say, a bond mutual fund, because a bond fund is like a safety investment for you, if you took some money out of that bond mutual fund and used it to buy this white hat annuity, you would create a higher income for yourself instantly because you can get more from the annuity than you can prudently take from the bond fund. So the immediate pay annuity is something that will help increase your income for life if you're kind of on the margin there and you're not sure you're going to make it. We have to talk, if not briefly, about uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, Obamacare, uh, since most medical dollars are spent by people in the l later years of their lives. Uh, so what's the best way to go on that? Well, first, I want to say a word for Obamacare, and this comes from my experience having been a freelancer all my life. Um, pre before Obamacare, if you were under 65 and anything happened to you from a health point of view, you could not get insurance or else you paid a fortune for insurance. So me as a freelancer, I, I had a job with a company that paid my health insurance and I was offered a chance to write this newspaper column for the Washington Post and I almost didn't do it because I was afraid that I would not have health insurance at some point because as an independent you just couldn't get it. Now with Obamacare, you can get health insurance, even if you, no matter what your health problem pre is. Pre-existing conditions pre are out. Pre-existing conditions, all that. And so people under 65 now have more choices in life. Because if you want to leave your job and, say, start a business, or you want to leave your job and volunteer for something and you're under 65, you know you can get health insurance. In the past, you didn't know that. So, so that's my case for Obamacare, is that it gives you more choices in life. And then for budgeting um, your medical expenses, I always say budget what your condition is now and then however much you spend per year on medical expenses, put that in your budget. But you have savings and if something unusual happens uh, that you would pay that out of savings. But Medicare really does a very good job as anyone on it knows. Well Jane, um, uh, this marvelous book and the many other tips you have in the book, reverse mortgages and uh, ways to amass uh, a sum of money which will help you in retirement. And everyone who is contemplating retirement or in retirement 
should read the book, but I have a question for you. What, of all the things that you have in the book, what would you hope people would get out of it? What I hope people will get out of it is you want you right size your life so that you have matched your income to your expenses. You have figured out based on how much you've saved and based on the formulas I have in this book to figure out how much you can safely draw out of savings for life. So now you know you've created a homemade paycheck for yourself and you know you're going to be okay financially. Then you can get on with all of the more important things in life, which is what you're going to do with yourself or your grandchildren or your golf or whatever. That is life. And to have, you must have that financial building block, which is what I'm hoping people will get from this book, mainly so that you can have something wonderful the rest of your life. A homemade paycheck for myself. I'm going to go out and cut it. <laughs> Jane Bryan Quinn, thank, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you. And thank you for coming by. Uh, tune in next week for more conversations in the digital age. I'm Jim Zirin. Uh, all the best. Thank you.